Please join me as we read our gospel lesson taken from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 16, verses 1 through 8, reading in Christ's name. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might go to anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, do not be alarmed. You see Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that Jesus is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Here ends our gospel lesson. You may be seated. So today is indeed a very special day that we celebrate as part of the Believing Church. This is a very special day, especially for those who are in Christ Jesus, who have been saved through his life, death, and resurrection. It's a glorious day where we praise and worship Christ for his wonderful resurrection, his glorious victory over sin, death, and the power of the devil. But as I was reading through the scripture lessons and preparing for this morning, I began to wonder what it was like for Saturday for those who were closest to Jesus. All they had seen and heard from the greatest man who had ever walked the face of this earth was now over. All the healings, all those who had been delivered from their demon possession, all those who were raised from the dead, all of these amazing things had now come to a very tragic and abrupt end. Or so they thought. For those who were closest to Jesus, this Sunday morning would hold for them the greatest surprise of their life. A surprise that they would never, ever forget. But for you and for me, we know the story. And sometimes, if I'm honest, I think we become too familiar, too comfortable with this story. But wouldn't it be amazing if we, by the means of the Holy Spirit, could experience just a little bit of what they experienced as their sorrow, their grief, their sadness, and maybe even their hopelessness was transformed into joy, into awe and wonder and gratitude and thankfulness. Because what we take for granted as believers in Christ Jesus and what we often fail to cherish as we should is now right in front of us. It's now right before our very eyes written in the words of Scripture. Christ's resurrection is the greatest rescue story of all time. And can I tell you why? Because he came to rescue you. What Christ accomplished on this day almost 2,000 years ago was for you. And in my opinion... I believe that's totally worth celebrating. Pray with me, please. Lord, I thank you for your selflessness, for your sacrifice, and for the precious salvation that you have provided through your life, death, and resurrection for any and all who believe. Lord, I do pray that every word that proceeds from my mouth will be from you and not from me. I pray that it's in the power of your Holy Spirit, according to your holy word and not from myself. Jesus, I pray that you would receive all the glory, honor, and praise. I pray all these things in Christ's precious name. And all of God's people said. And so there's three basic scenes in our text in the Gospel of Mark. And the very first scene, as we look at verses 1 and 2, is that Sunday morning and several of the women go to visit Jesus in the tomb. And so this is kind of where I began to think. I'm like, what was running through their minds on this Sunday morning? They left when it was dark and the sun was, was rising. And how fitting is that? That as the sun was rising in the sky, the Son of God had already risen from the dead. But think about all of the grief, the sorrow, the despair. And as I said, maybe even the hopelessness that they were all feeling in various degrees. What would that be like? How would that feel if I could put myself into their shoes for a moment? 
and experience the resurrection for the very first time in history. The greatest holy man that they had ever met was now dead and in a tomb. These women had to watch the unthinkable. They watched this holy man, this righteous man, this man Jesus, as he was bruised, as he was beaten, as he was whipped and mocked and tortured. But the moment that most likely caused them the most grief and the most sorrow, I know it would for me, is watching an innocent man be nailed to the cross of Calvary. An innocent man was murdered by the sinfulness of men. And I think if we're honest, as we talked about on Good Friday, I think we can kind of identify with some of that sorrow and some of that grief if we're honest. Because as I said on Good Friday, it was our sin that sent him there. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5, remind us of this. And what I love about this is this was written before crucifixion even existed. It was written over 700 years before Christ died for you and for me. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5 says, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and by his wounds we are healed. And so maybe we can relate a little bit if we're willing to. If we're willing to be a little, a little honest and maybe even brutally honest, that it was indeed our sin that sent him to the cross of Calvary. He was mur murdered by sinful man, but he was murdered because of our sin. He was killed for our iniquities. The second scene that we see in our text is that the women arrive at the tomb and they meet an angel who has a message for them. Let's pick it up in verse two. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb and they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe. And they were alarmed and they said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. And so think about that for a little bit. Try to put yourself in their shoes. That grief, that sorrow of watching the most incredible man you had ever met be nailed to a cross and murdered in such a brutal way. All of that pain, anguish, and sorrow. And now here they see this humongous stone rolled away and the tomb is empty. But it isn't quite empty, is it? As they walk in, and we'll, we'll hear about this in a little bit, the linen cloths that wrapped the body of Christ were folded up neatly on one side and then another. And there's some imagery there that we're going to talk about. But they see this man sitting there, this man dressed in a white robe who has a message for them. You look for Jesus of Nazareth. He was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See, the tomb is empty. And so I don't know about you, but trying to experience this for the first time, I, I tried to think about how it would be, it would be hard to understand it, but there would be something in me that wanted to. Amen? And so these women were afraid because now this great man, this man named Jesus, was not only dead, his body is gone. And here's this angel speaking to them saying, Christ is risen, he's not here. It would seem a little too unbelievable, wouldn't it? It might even seem a little too miraculous, maybe a little bit too fantastical. But what's extraordinary about the holy word of God is, as I said previously, there's over 300 Old Testament prophecies about this. We talk about the great sacrifice of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So now can you imagine what's running through their mind? As we can see in the text, fear grips them. Their astonishment, and their amazement. The range of emotions that they were experienced, I can only imagine had it been a bit of a roller coaster to go from grief, sadness, despair to now shock, awe, and fear. 
the man that loved more, the man that healed more, the, more, the man that cared more than anyone who had ever lived was not only dead, but now his body's missing. A man that they loved, a man named Jesus. In the midst of all these things, the angel had a little bit more to tell him and reveal to them. And that's where we pick up our third scene, reading in verses eight, seven and eight of Mark chapter 16. But go tell his disciples and Peter that Jesus was going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And they went out and they fled from the tomb for trembling and astonishment had seized him. That word fled means to, to run. They moved quickly. They were, there, was, there was fear there. Trembling and astonishment had seized them and they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. The beautiful thing about this as we look at this, and we're going to look at a couple other portions of scripture to kind of get the chronology of this event. One of the books that I absolutely love is called The Harmony of the Gospels, and it goes through the life of Christ in a chronological way. It puts all the scriptures together from all four gospels, and you can study the life of Christ in more of a historical and chronological fashion. So I'm going to pick it up at verse 8 again, but then I'm going to jump to Luke chapter 24, Beginning in verse 9, we're going to read a couple of verses from there, and then we're going to jump to John chapter 20, and you'll see the chronology here of this incredible event. So reading in Mark chapter 16, verse 8, and then jumping to Luke 24, and then John 20. And they went out and they fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the 11 and to the rest. Fear didn't stop them from preaching the good news. Fear didn't stop them from doing what the angel had asked them. Luke continues, but these words seemed to them as an idle tale, and they did not believe. But there was still something going on in Peter and John's heart. So Peter went out with the other disciple, that's John, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together. But the other disciple outran Peter. I think that's kind of funny. I think John and Peter had a bit of a rivalry, and John just had to put that in there. Yeah, I beat him. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple, John, outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloth lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. And isn't that just like Peter? The, impet the kind of the impetuous nature of Peter who just kind of jumps before he thinks. Here it was a good thing. Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb and he saw the linen cloth lying there and the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head not lying with the linen cloth but folded up in a place by itself. So they were separate. One at the head, one at the feet. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first, see that, and John there, that little competition there? <laughs> then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed. What a beautiful picture that the disciple whom Jesus loved, John the apostle, believed at that moment. But the others didn't and it, it expresses that. It was kind of a slow transition. So that grief, that sorrow, that hopelessness, that fear now, and the amazement and the shock and awe was slowly begin to transform. But think about how that could have felt. It'd be extraordinary. But what happens next is even more extraordinary. And this is what I'm going to leave you guys with this morning. If we continue in John chapter 20, Mary Magdalene now comes into the picture. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels, one at his head, one at his feet, where he was. Two angels in white sitting there where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. The symbolism here is very intentional. In fact, one central theme that is intrinsically interwoven into the scriptures of the Gospel of John is the fact that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Passover lamb. Jesus is the fulfillment of scriptures past. 
The imagery of an angel, two angels sitting there, one at the, at the foot and one at the head, should bring us right back to the Old Testament to something called the mercy seat. We remember the Ark of the Covenant that had the Ten Commandments in it. And on the top of that Ark of the Covenant, there was a thing called the mercy seat. And there were two angels, one at the head of it and one at the foot of it. Now, the mercy seat had great significance in, in the nation of Israel. In Leviticus chapter 16, it's talked about that there was this day of atonement. And this, on this day of atonement, all of Israel would gather And they would sacrifice the goat and then they would lay the sin of the people on another goat and send it out of the camp. And that too represents Christ because there's a payment of sin and a removal of sin through Christ's atoning sacrifice. But the Hebrew word for mercy seat literally means atonement cover. So the mercy seat, what it symbolized and how Israel saw the mercy seat, it was the place and the means by which the forgiveness of sin is found. Well, who does that sound like? The place and the means by which the forgiveness of sin is found. Jesus is the mercy seat. Can anybody say amen? Now, the New Testament word for mercy seat is oftentimes translated propitiation. Ever struggle in saying that word? In 1 John The Apostle John writes this in the second chapter of his epistle. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation, the mercy seat for our sins. And not for ours only, but that of the whole world. Jesus has paid it all. Jesus accomplished what no one else could. From a human perspective, this seems fantastical. It seems too miraculous. But if we understand God's justice properly in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, the only way that we could be saved is if someone took our place and paid for the legal demands of the law, that, of the sin that we committed. Paul talks about this in Colossians chapter 2. Jesus lived the perfect life that we could not. He paid for the totality of the sin of the world, which we just saw on the cross of Calvary, and three days later, won the victory as the risen and living Savior, who is Christ the Lord. The perfect human being made the perfect sacrifice, and the perfect God who took on human flesh made it eternally inexhaustible for any and all who will place their trust in him as Lord, Savior, and Messiah. Jesus has won the victory over sin, death, and the power of the devil. And this is where sorrow, grief, amazement, and maybe even fear gets totally transformed into joy, into dancing, into gratitude and thankfulness. Hallelujah. Though our sorrow may tarry for the night, joy comes in the morning, Easter Sunday morning. And that's what we celebrate here today. And so Christ accomplished what seemed impossible. But remember what the scripture says, with God, all things are possible. Jesus has won the victory and he shares that victory with any and all who trust in him as Lord, Savior, and Messiah. He has conquered the grave and he did so in order to save you. And so make it personal this morning. Jesus has conquered the grave for you and for me. And so today, we celebrate the living and risen Savior who is Christ the Lord. And help me out here, because Christ has risen. He is risen indeed. Christ has risen. He is risen indeed. Christ has risen. He is risen indeed. Just as he promised. Just as the Old Testament predicts. And to that, I say thank you. And hallelujah. Hallelujah. God, we thank you that you showed your extravagant grace and mercy through the most selfless, sacrificial act that this universe has ever seen. 
So many times we, we can't understand it from a human perspective, but each one of us knows that we are guilty. Each one of us knows intrinsically that we commit sin on a regular basis and that sin has to be paid for and that payment, that mercy seat is Jesus. Lord, you have paid it all. All to you we owe because sin had left a crimson stain and through your mighty resurrection, you have washed it white as snow. Praise be to you. I pray this in Christ's name. And all of God's people said,